Colonel Chris Hadfield is one of the most famous astronauts on Earth. During his three space flights, he became well known for the videos he posted online detailing his experience as the first Canadian commander of the International Space Station. Newsday host Ashley Gillen spoke to Chris this week. He's in Melbourne addressing a cyber conference and speaking to children about leadership. Chris, regular viewers will know I'm a bit of a space nerd, so I am absolutely thrilled that you've been able to join us today. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are speaking at a very difficult time. The world seems like a very bleak place right now. What does the experience of being in space and seeing the Earth look like such a tiny ball do to your perspective on world events? I assume it changes your whole outlook on life. Uh, I've been in space during uh, previous wars as well, the Gulf War, for example, where you see some place of incredible human conflict and, and extremely uh, regrettable, destructive human behaviors. But in the same orbit, you, in not just 90 minutes, you see the rest of the world. You see the billions of people who are leading their lives peaceably and pr productively. And it doesn't excuse the wickedness of some human behavior, but I think it at least helps put it into both the, the localized and the historical perspective. And I think that perspective of seeing the world that way is even more important now than ever. Chris, you are clearly one of those overachiever types. Before you went to space, you were a top test pilot in, in both the US Air Force and the US Navy, or now a best-selling author. How tricky was it to figure out what you wanted to do with your life after you returned from space? Because I assume that's a pretty hard experience to top. And Ash, imagine if you had just been flying a spaceship and you'd plummeted down through the atmosphere and you'd, the parachutes had opened and you'd rolled to a stop and you open up the hatch and you emerge blinking back into the world. What do you do with an experience like that? It's so incredibly rich and formative because it's decades of preparation. And so I, I feel a great uh, public trust and responsibility to try and share it as well as, as well as I'm capable so as it can maybe give other people the chance to make different or more informed decisions with their life. It's also just so joyful. So many movies make space flight look sort of grim and dark. It's not. It's great. It's the exploration of the rest of the universe. And so uh, I, I write and perform music. I have uh, a best-selling book out right now, in fact, thriller fiction called The Defense. Um, I speak all over the world like I am here at the cyber conference in Melbourne. I, uh, I, I just think the sharing of the richness of human experience, especially for someone who's been as lucky as me, is really important. And let's talk about your space experience because you did have some pretty scary times, as joyful as you say it is. I understand you went blind temporarily doing your first spacewalk. Tell us how that happened and, and how did you cope with it? Because I imagine a spacewalk would be as terrifying enough without losing your vision at the same time. Well, one of the coolest things, maybe the coolest thing I've done in my whole life, has been to uh, put on the big white spacesuit and go out uh, uh, into the universe itself alone with one other astronaut out there. It is so gorgeous seeing the world that way and, and to be in the, the immense eternal three-dimensionality of the universe. But while I was outside on a spacewalk, there was contamination inside my suit that fouled one eye and struck it essentially blind, and then eventually got into both eyes. And so I found myself blinded outside, uh, orbiting the world at 17,000 miles an hour on my first space flight. But it, it's not what happens, it's how you react in life, right? And, and I had trained for years, and I knew that the fellow that was out there with me, Scott Berzinski, he could come and maneuver me back into the airlock if I couldn't solve the problem myself. And it's just vision. I mean, I, I can still breathe. I've got four other senses. And if I blinked really hard, I could sort of make out light and dark. So I, I knew that, uh, hey, this is a thing that I didn't want to happen, but uh, there's going to be some way to work through this. And what's really going to define success here or not is what we do next. And so we, we did all the appropriate things. I uh, allowed my emergency oxygen system to, to help uh, clean up the atmosphere inside the suit. Eventually, it evaporated my tears. I could see again. We, we fixed the system permanently so that other astronauts won't be blinded. And we got the whole spacewalk done. 
but but at the time it was definitely something you you uh, you wanted to be prepared for, and that's why astronauts train for so many years to get ready for that type of thing to happen and still be able to succeed and prevail. So after all that training and and uh, despite that experience you just shared with us, what was the most surprising thing for you once you were up there in space? Uh, two things, Ash. Weightlessness is the coolest thing ever. You can fly. I mean, you have a uh, superpower. You, you, can, you can push off with the gentle of forces and just fly to the other side of the room. You're like, uh, I don't know, Spider-Man or Tinkerbell or Superwoman or something. It's just so cool. And, and, and you, you get used to it immediately. It seems so unfair when you come back to Earth and you're all oppressed by gravity. The second is... I've been around the world uh, 2,650 times. So I've seen the world as it turned underneath me and, and winter and summer swapped ends on the world over six months. And it was just so uh, constantly, generously beautiful and so instructional to get to see our world as a living, breathing um, home for life for, for billions of years. It, w it was immensely optimism building to get a real understanding of the toughness and the age and the resilience of our planet. It makes you doubly resolved to try and be part of helping people make better decisions and lead better lives on Earth and sort of to be a more thoughtful and responsible steward of the planet as well. It, it's it, it, the combination of weightlessness and seeing the world for what it truly is changes you forever. Chris, I wanted to ask you, I saw a study recently suggesting that long space missions take a toll on astronaut brains. Clearly speaking with you, you have a very highly functioning brain, but have you had any <laughs> adverse health impacts that you put down to your time in space? It sounds like we're really still learning a lot about those longer term impacts of that experience. No, we don't know for sure what the long-term impact of space flight is. There's only been a very small number of human beings that have spent months or even years in space. And so every year I go back to the Johnson Space Center with NASA and do a very detailed physical. Maybe all of us long-term astronauts will get cataracts or maybe we'll all get a certain type of cancer or maybe we'll all live 10 years longer or whatever. We don't know the answer. So we're, we're the, the laboratory rats that they're still continuing to study for the rest of my life. But, I mean, spending a long time on Earth has its uh, physiological toll also. And uh, I, I think personally, the, the fitness required and the, the mental preparation required and the busyness of life and the habits you develop, I think, in fact, overall, we're going to find it, it's better for you than any sort of the negative aspects. But uh, it's still new. Space exploration is younger than I am. When I was born, no one had flown in space. It's all happened in my lifetime. And I'm really happy to be uh, part of the group of people that's helping to understand it as we move further and further away from Earth out into the solar system. Chris Hadfield, an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. Thanks again. Thank you, Ash. Lovely to speak with you.